Thank, Thank you, Kate. You. Thank you. Uh, you're worn out? Not too bad. Not too bad. I slept pretty well. <laughs> How's it going with the kids? The kids are, oh, the kids are great. They, they just started asking questions and I got yanked out. So I think they kind of went, oh, oh. But I'll go back again. So Fantastic. Now, that was, it's kind of your background, isn't it, with teaching, etc. Yes. I was a primary school teacher for about six years before we had children. And then we've had our own children. Did a little bit of, you know, the odd bits and pieces in schools uh, while the kids were very young. Uh, but, yeah, haven't, haven't been back for a few years now. Okay. Now, today, today we're going to cross across some of the territory of last night. So if you're here last night, you'll hear some of those things again and into some new areas about your own kind of story. So the, 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 the applying, as you said last night, applying for MasterChef. And uh, by the way, you must be sick of telling this story. <laughs> but, I've told it quite a few times, but yeah. <laughs> Is it getting better on the retelling? You'll be pleased to know the story stays the same. Oh, good job. I decided very <laughs> early on in the whole MasterChef experience, I just had to tell the truth because otherwise I wasn't going to be able to keep up. <laughs> so give us a picture. you Because Luke, your husband, actually saw it before you did. That's right. Luke saw, I, I don't know, he's, he has this uncanny ability of being able to just know what's going on all the time everywhere. And so he came home from work one day and said to me, there's this new show coming called MasterChef. They've got a version of it in the UK. I reckon you should go on it. So I went online and watched... Um, an episode on TV on the computer of the UK version of MasterChef and went, that looks like so much fun. So I jumped on the computer and filled out the online application form for season one of MasterChef. But I got to the last question and it said, are you willing to be away from your family for up to four months for filming? And my baby was one. And I went, no, no, I'm not willing to do that. So I didn't end up sending the application. Obviously, though, I was... I was now aware of what this show was and what was coming, and so I watched it quite avidly. And then I watched all of season two quite avidly. And at the end of season two, I remember seeing an ad on TV about applications. If you want to join season three, go online. I had absolutely no desire to go on season three, but I was really curious to see how the application form had changed from season one, because, you know, MasterChef had become this juggernaut uh, so I went online, but it was one of those systems where you had to fill out every single field before they'd let you go onto the next page. So, you know, while my baby was asleep, <laughs> she'd have a daytime nap, I'd uh, fill out a few more questions and um, got to the end, and there was that little send button. I thought, oh, will I send it? Oh, well, I'll just send it, see what happens. Send. I thought that that was the end of it. So, so uh, uh, an incredibly passionate um, uh, connection with the idea. Listen, let me go back to Luke. I mean, most husbands, like me, think their wives are the best cooks in the world. Um, so the, the idea of, of so was cooking was obviously more than just you were good at it. it was, there was something that, that uh, he felt that you were re really good at it. I think it was actually more a case of he knew that I was passionate about it. Yes. I don't know that either of us ever really thought I was that great at it. It's just that I loved it. Um, in fact, he actually, um, when I sent off the application form, I had said to him, I, I then got a, an invite back to an audition and I said to him, I can't do that, I can't go on MasterChef. He said, oh look, you might as well just go, it's a weekend away from the kids, go and have fun, you, you won't get it anyway. <laughs> Thanks. So, you know, I don't think it was really I'm sure a case that was of reverse, <laughs> I'm sure that was reverse psychology. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so sure. He always tells me how he sees it. Um, so yeah, it wasn't so much that we thought I was a great cook, it was more that he, he's known obviously that I've been... I've loved cooking from the time I was quite young. And I guess he's seen... I've always tried to go to cooking classes or if there were ever information nights on food products, I'd go. So he saw that. And, and he has always been incredibly encouraging of me pursuing my interests. And so I think it was just another extension of that. I'm not sure if he knew exactly what he was encouraging me to do and what <laughs> impact that was going to have on him long term. But, you know, that's all history now. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to some of that. Just we, you, you said last night, you told the story last night at, at, at the age of eight, starting your first cake, yep. as it were. How, how did it the, the develop from there into something that's more than just an interest of food to being a passion for cooking? I think it's, it's been a really gradual process. I shared last night that as a child, I was actually a really fussy eater. Didn't like fruit, didn't like vegetables, didn't like meat. My lunchbox was always a Vegemite sandwich, an apple and a popper, and that was it. That was about as good as my nutrition got. Um, but I've always loved cakes and biscuits and ice cream and all those kinds of, you know, naughty things. And so that was where my cooking started, was always with those baked things. And then I think as I grew older and I actually started to appreciate 
nutritious food, <laughs> other food, I actually then started to take more of an interest in cooking those things as well. And I think as well, becoming an adult and starting to eat in restaurants, and it started to, to pique my interest in, in food and think, oh, I'd love to know how they cooked that because it tastes so great. And so that's why I started going along to cooking classes. Then when we bought our first house, I started to get a bit of a green thumb. I started to want to plant herbs and, and productive garden um, plants. And so suddenly I had herbs on tap. I could just go out to the garden and pick them. So I'd start experimenting a bit more like that. And then we moved to orange. And orange is a really big food bowl. And it's particularly over the last 10 to 15 years, um, there's a lot of um, passionate foodies out there. And so moving out there was just more inspiration. I actually started cooking way more in the savoury realm. I sort of left the baking for a bit because suddenly I was presented with this incredible local produce. I remember the first day we, the first week we arrived in Orange, a guy uh, turned up on our doorstep with this box of cherries that had just come off his farm and they were like the size of plums. They were incredible and we had five kilos of them. So suddenly I started doing all these things with cherries. Yeah, the only thing I tend to do with cherries is eat them. Um, <laughs> this, you... you Let's, let's jump forward in the picture. You, you, go, you go through the process, you decide to go on the show. You've, you, first day in the house, what's that like? Really nerve-wracking. <laughs> to me, going into the house was probably the scariest part of the whole thing because, you know, it just plays with your mind when you think, I'm moving away from my family and everything I know and that's comfortable there and I'm going to live with 24 strangers. And I know from watching MasterChef that they like to pick people from very different walks of life. Um, and so when I first went into the house, it, it was a little bit, okay, I don't know where I am and what I'm doing here, but we've just got to go with it. Um, but I tell you what, in the end, it turned out to be one of the best parts of the entire experience was getting to know people. I've always enjoyed talking to people. I've always enjoyed getting to know people. And to have that opportunity to be in a house with people that in any other situation, I probably wouldn't have sat down and built a relationship with them. But here we were thrown together with this common experience of this roller coaster of emotions of MasterChef. And we suddenly had not just our love of food in common, but also this MasterChef experience. And you can't help but bond with people when you go through that. And so I now have um, a huge range of friends from all different walks of life, and it's been such a privilege to get to know them. Interesting mix, isn't it? Because you are sort of in competition with them in the process of bonding with them. So... Yeah, it's a very strange thing. Um, and I think I was very aware of that going in. I thought, I don't want it to be feeling competitive the whole time we're there. And for me, I was never really there to win. I was there to learn as much as I could. So there were a couple of us that sort of gelled fairly early on that had a similar approach too. And so we sort of just kept saying over and over and over, let's leave what... what so what happens in the kitchen stays in the kitchen, you know. So whatever happens in the studio, if that's competitive, great, do it. That's where the competition is. But when we're home, let's just be each other's family because nobody else um, is... We, we haven't got our families here with us. And so very early on, this sort of developed. And so the house actually became a bit of a, a refuge. They sort of messed that up a bit when they started to bring challenges into the house. But, you know, we just had to, we had to just go with that. One of the things that's been said about MasterChef over the little while in the media is that it, it tended to shift. Reality TV before that it tended to be um, fairly brutal. It was, you know, your 15 minutes not of success and fame but of, uh, of, of embarrassment. MasterChef tended to have a different feel. Was that, was that a production kind of set of values? I think they realised, from what I understand, in the first series, um, they realised within the first few weeks of filming that they had something quite different. And I don't know that it was necessarily intentional. I think it was just the group of people that they happened to pull together who love food. And the general thing with foodies is they generally love to share. Like, that's part of the joy of food and cooking. And so I think when you put a group of them together, it's harder to get that animosity because everybody just wants to share the information that they have and the food that they have. And so I, I'm not sure that they initially set out to make it quite so warm and fuzzy, but I think it naturally became that. And they realised very early on, hang on a second, we've got something different here, let's run with it. And so they didn't ask questions that dug the knife into people. And um, they wanted you to be honest. So sometimes you still do get comments perhaps that um, could be construed in different ways. But on the whole, I think they just wanted to portray it for what it was as opposed to try and um, make it into something that it wasn't. And I think when they saw the public perception of, hey, this is reality TV done a completely different way, that they, 
they realised they were on a winner and, and went with it. Yeah, and to be honest, if you, I still cringe a little bit when I think I went on reality TV. I think, really? <laughs> it wasn't really reality TV, was it? Wasn't it? Yes. Yes, it wasn't exactly Big Brother, was it? Now, just in the process, like a, lot of people, a couple of people asked questions last night. So give us a picture of what a, a day was like when you're in the house. So the logistics of television are, are very big, particularly on a, a show of that magnitude. Um, so our days generally started at about five in the morning, sometimes a bit earlier, sometimes a bit later, and a camera crew would come into the house. As you probably gather, if you ever watch it, they, fo they only follow a few people's story through the episode. Because if you've got 24 people, you logistically cannot follow 24 people. So in the morning, so they don't know which people are going to have a good day and which people are going to have a bad day. So they have to film every single person going about their morning business. Uh, so they would come and film in the house for about a couple of hours, depending on where in the competition we were. At the beginning, it took a lot longer, as there's less people, obviously, it takes a shorter amount of time. Then we would get to the studio and we'd have to drive, drive up to the studio and of course that all has to be filmed. And I guess what you as viewers don't realise is that um, they're filming it from lots of different angles. So you have to do multiple takes of those bits so that you as the viewer feel like you're in the room turning around looking in different ways. But if a camera's here, then a camera can't be over there because they would be in the shot. So you have to do all the things like walking in and walking out and getting the judgments from the judges and those kinds of things take a long, a long period of time. The cooking itself is exactly that time. So if they said we had 90 minutes to cook, we had 90 minutes to cook, not a second longer. Step away from the benches. So, um, but apart from that, everything outside of that could have multiple um, takes done. And you see, obviously, the very edited version. It was quite frustrating, actually, when I saw the first couple of episodes. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'd look at something and they'd show it for, you know, five seconds and think, that took us three hours to film and they used five seconds. Um, so, yeah, the days were long. And then if we were filming in the house after... Um, the challenge, then they would come back to the house and film. So the day generally ended at about six or seven at night. Um, so yeah, it was a long day. But there's lots of periods of waiting there as well because moving cameras and like the crew is huge. The, at, the, at top 50, the crew was numbered about 90. And that's just the crew. Now that dwindles down as the numbers of contestants dwindle down. But yeah, there's a lot of logistics of moving those people around and making sure people have got breaks. So there is a lot of waiting. So in the process, one of the things that's off that you would have been asked all the time, which you didn't realise uh, at the time in the house was such a big deal, uh, but got a lot of press, and we talked about last night as well, which is kind of your, your faith in the house, which actually came to a kind of, uh, I guess, public point around the Dalai Lama. And uh, was, that, was that a kind of a fit of peak on your behalf or wanting to make a Christian statement or uh, what was that about? Well, for me, I decided very early on before I went in that I was just going to be real. It was reality TV. I needed to be who I was. And because I'm a Christian, it, it came out pretty quickly to the producers and to the other contestants that I was a Christian. Um, but it never really made any of the edits. So it was not known, I suppose, in the, in the public forum. Uh, but then the challenge with the Dalai Lama came. Um, and so again, I, I wasn't really aware because I didn't know what was making the edit and what wasn't making the edit. Um, but it became obvious to me that the normal term that you use to address the Dalai Lama is your holiness. And as a Christian, my understanding of holiness is that you're perfectly right with God. And that means that the only person that's holy is Jesus. So I'm not holy, you're not holy, and the Dalai Lama is not holy. Uh, so I, I sort of had a bit of a think and thought, I'm going to have to try and work out what else I can call him because I can't in good conscience, if I'm going to be true to myself, call him your holiness. And I actually spoke to a producer, I shared this last night, I spoke to a producer and said, can you find out what else I can call him? And we had a meeting to discuss protocol and, and timing because the Dalai Lama's schedule is incredibly tight. Uh, and so there's a meeting of about 180, 200 people there with all the crew and all the... Um, all the people from the venue, and this producer comes up to me and says, now's your time to ask. So in front of all these people, I had to ask that, you know, and I simply said, look, I'm a Christian, I, I don't feel comfortable calling him your holiness, but I do want to show him respect. Is there something that you could suggest that I could call him instead of your holiness? And the lady who was leading this meeting said, oh, of course, you could call him Dalai Lama. He wouldn't mind that at all. So for me, in my mind, I didn't really think it was going to be even noticed 
on TV. Um, but there was a journalist there that day and she'd been interviewing us uh, before and after the challenge. And so a lot of her interview of me ended up in the papers, I suppose, because um, it became a little bit controversial that I was the only one that didn't call him Your Holiness. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, in, uh, uh, I think in hindsight, um, while I didn't know it was going on, it actually reflected the way I was throughout the entire competition. And if you notice, on the actual show, it never really made the edit any discussion. I, I talked about it in interviews, but those things were just left out of the edit. So the only realm in which it was made known was in the, in the newspapers. But once one gets a hold of it, they all do. <laughs> now, you, you had, had said, we've, we've spoken about this uh, last night and before, that um, you, you weren't actually praying to win. If God answered your prayers, you wouldn't have won. That's and true. <laughs> so, but you, get, you must get to a stage, I don't know, eight, five, four, three, obviously two. You're yeah. thinking, so at what point did you kind of go, actually, maybe I'm in here? Yeah, for me, the, the motivation all along was actually just to learn as much as I could. And I, I kind of surprised myself when I got to top ten. I was thinking, oh, okay, wow, halfway through. I thought I would have been gone a long time ago. But I still wasn't really thinking about winning. Um, uh, it was really at top five, I think, when we got down to top five and I suddenly realised, okay, I've gone from one in thousands to one in five. Now, what if? What would happen? And that was the first time it sort of dawned on me, oh, I could actually win. What would happen then? And, and I think my fear came more from the change that that would bring to my life. Um, it wasn't so much being afraid of winning itself. It was just the, the flow-on effect for me but also for my family. Um, and I think that's the thing I was most afraid of. Um, and now, having done it, I needn't have been so afraid. It's been, it's been wonderful and the opportunities have been fantastic. But whereas the judges at the beginning, you know, used to say to us, you've entered MasterChef because you want to change your life. I was thinking, I actually don't want to change my life. I quite like it the way it is. I just want to learn more about cooking. So, yeah, I think um, winning was just one of those things that obviously God had in store that I... Um, didn't, but it has turned out to be a wonderful opportunity. Before we get a bit, bit more into your story, you've, you're filming at the moment again. What, what, uh, what's this series now? So we've actually just finished filming the MasterChef All-Stars. We finished filming that on Thursday. Uh, so that's uh, another... They're doing a three-week series. So it's very short, looking, looking back. So there's a team from 2009, there's a team from 2010, and there's a team from 2011. And to be honest, when they first approached me about it, I said to them, no, I'm not doing that. I can't go back. I can't do that again. Largely because of the impact on my family. I've only just come off the back of book tour and life had just started to settle. And I thought, I can't, I can't do that again. But when they explained to me uh, that it's a very different system. So in, in season three, we were gone for seven months. We had three production breaks in that time where we came home. We had one weekly phone call. However, for me, with my children, um, with the ages that they were, I also had two Skype calls and I had visits from them every two to three weeks. But that still wasn't enough. I wanted more. I always wanted more. Um, so the idea of going back into something like that, I definitely couldn't have done that again. However, this time with MasterChef All-Stars, um, they flew us home every weekend um, and we had phones with us the entire time so I could speak to the kids um, every day. Uh, and also, um, the children were, and Luke were welcome on set any day that they liked. So, because it was school holidays, they came down for a few days and they came on set. Um, the producers actually offered to put them up in Sydney for the entire time so that I could have seen them every day. Um, so, because it was a very different situation, I actually sat down with the kids. I was still a little bit nervous. I thought, oh, I don't know if I want to go back to all that pressure. And so I, we, I said to Luke, can we just have to do a bit of a family meeting? I need to find out what everybody thinks and I need to have the kids involved in this decision. And secretly I was hoping they'd all say, don't go, mummy. But they didn't. <laughs> they all said, yeah, do it again. I was like, oh, no. So, um, yeah, so I, I headed off and did it again. Yeah, well, we'll wait to see the results. No, you can't talk about that. Uh, just Kate Brax as a, as a kid growing up. What was, what was faith like for you? Where was that? I grew up in a Christian family, so mum and dad always um, took us to church and they were very active in their church. Um, I, grew up, I had one of those classic, happy, carefree childhood um, and so I feel incredibly privileged and blessed to have that. Um, and mum and dad moved churches, I think, to suit our needs. So as we grew, um, we were involved you know, in, a, in a great youth group when um, we were teenagers 
so yeah, my, my childhood, I have very fond memories of, of church and of um, praying with mum and dad. They didn't read the Bible a lot with us. I think for them it was... Um, at that stage in their lives, it was also a, a little bit about doing the right thing, going to church on Sundays, praying before you go to sleep. Um, but one of the beautiful things for me has been watching their faith grow over the years as well. And so they're now both very active Christians in their daily lives. Um, but I also came to a, I came to a point um, after my year 12, I actually went and did a gap year in England for a year. Um, and it was interesting because my... My entire support network was gone. My church family was gone. My family was gone. And really, it came down to me. Was I actually going to continue to live as a Christian? And the sad thing is, is that I realized that while I believed in God, I really didn't live with any reference to God in that year and in the couple of years following that. I, I sort of let things go. Um, and I think what that showed was that perhaps I didn't fully understand what it was. I'd relied on the fact that mum and dad were Christians, therefore I was a Christian. And so I came to a point a couple of years after um, where I just felt that life was really empty. Um, I felt that it was shallow. I, I didn't know why I was here, what my purpose was. And um, I... I Basically, I needed answers, and so I went searching. But I was really conscious not to just presume that Christianity was the only option. So I actually did a lot of reading about a lot of different religions. I talked to people, um, and over a period probably of about a year, I just tried to investigate what each sort of life view, I suppose, had on offer. Um, and the, the thing I found was that um, God was the only one who really uh, loved me for who I was and didn't expect anything from me in terms of um, I realised that I could do nothing that he did everything and every other religion that I looked at it was about you know if you look at Islam it's about following all these rules to in order to press Allah if you look at Buddhism it's about it's about um, reaching all these different goals so that you can eventually reach Nirvana the Hindus it's all about pleasing various gods and suffering if, if you don't manage to please them in the right way and and even with you know um, atheism it's it's even about having this very well thought philosophy in order of understanding the world and it, it all is about me and and what I do and what I think and when I looked at Christianity and I looked at the God of the Bible um, I realized that he it was not about me it was actually about what he and what about him and what he had done for me and I think um, the journey I went on was this journey of discovery I suppose of the fact that he desperately wanted a relationship with me not just me following a list of rules um, not me having to just go to church, do this, do this, don't do this. It was actually about wanting an ongoing relationship with me and that he was willing to go to such lengths to get that. He knew that I couldn't follow a list of rules um, and because by nature I think we all, we all reject God, ignore God, but you know, our natural inclination is to want to do things our own way, not to, not to listen to the authority of other people. Um, and, and therefore, God can't have a relationship with us if we don't want a part of it. You know, it's got to go two ways. Um, and so by sending Jesus to take the punishment for my rejection of God, it frees us up to have that relationship with God again that's perfectly right. And it doesn't mean that I now completely um, always get it right and always live God's way. I still make mistakes. But the fact is that I'm forgiven for that because the punishment's already been dealt with. Jesus took that for me. And to realise that God would go to such lengths in order to have that relationship with me was quite mind-blowing when I compared it to everything else that the world had on offer. And I started to understand my place in the world, the fact that I was here on earth because God wanted to know me and he wanted me to know him. And then my relationship with God starts now and then lasts for eternity. And so I, I feel incredibly liberated, I suppose, by that, yep. that I'm not bound by a list of do's and don'ts. Um, obviously, because of my gratitude for what God has done, it does impact the way I live. It changes the way I live. I want to live in a way that pleases him, but I recognise that it's not that itself that makes me right with God. So it, it, it does things like it makes me not want to call the Dalai Lama your holiness, 
But by not calling him your holiness is not the thing that pleases God. Yeah. The yeah. thing that pleases God is the fact that we have a right relationship because of what he's done with Jesus. You, you looked at that over a year. What, what was the kind of the end result at the end of that year? Did you, did you make some sort of a step of faith or recon? Well, the, the thing is because I'd grown up in the church, I'd been christened, I'd had confirmation. And so when I came to this decision, I actually, um, really it came down to the decisions that I was making in my day-to-day -day life. I was in a long-term relationship with a boy friend that I knew was not pleasing God. And so I had to end that. And that was pretty hard. I'd been with him for about six years. And so that was a big decision. Um, and there were decisions I suppose to go back to church even though I felt, I felt at that time like, um, you know, it had been a while since I'd been and I wasn't sure what I was walking back into and whether I was going to be judged. But because I had this relationship with God, I wanted to be with God's people and I wanted to learn more and I knew that was the place to be. Wow. I mean, it's interesting, Kate, that you... Um the step forward was actually putting something aside. Um, I guess at that age bracket, the, 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 the ditching of a boyfriend of six years is a pretty big decision. Yeah, and, that, and I think that was when I knew, when I got to the point, I actually realised I had to choose him or God. And I think that was, that was the point at which I would say I actually made the decision for God. Um, because, yeah, that was a tough decision. But, yeah, yeah no regrets. Go, going back to church... Was that okay? It was actually fantastic. Um, my older sister ha was a very strong Christian. My younger sister had actually, interestingly, been through a very similar journey to me. She'd done a year away and had a very similar situation. And she and I had been talking one night with our other sister. And our other sister suggested we start a different church rather than going back to an old one that we'd been at. And so we started a, a church at Macquarie University. Um, and it was so funny. We turned up and there was basically nobody there. And we thought, oh, no, can't believe Sal's suggested this church. But the sermon was really good. And we were thinking, this, okay, this is just odd. So we decided, well, let's give it one more go next week. We turned up the next week and it was packed. Turns out the first week we'd been, it was uni holidays. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up being there for a few years and I think we were taught very well. Um, and I think that's where I first really grasped how the Bible taught about God's grace, that idea that it's all about what he's done and not what, not what we do. What, do you, what do you think for you now, putting together your faith journey, this incredible experience and what you're now doing, how do you kind of in your head put all that together? What do you think the next few years it will be for you? I've got absolutely no idea what the next few years are for me. <laughs> um, the way that I think about life, and, and this pretty much started from the decision to go to MasterChef, because in and of myself, I was pretty terrified of the whole process. Um, but for me, I, I felt a strong prompting to go. And, and for me as a Christian, I believe that um, God just wants us to be a Christian wherever we are. I don't necessarily think he, he says, go here, do this. I think for some people he does, but he, no matter where we are, whether it's in our family, whether it's in our workplace, whether it's on MasterChef or national television, just be who we are in him in that place. And so I think that's what I continue to do. I have to keep trusting that he will guide me in where I go. And um, there is incredible comfort in that because if without him, I think I would continue to be terrified and I'd probably just stop. I'd just back away, go back into my little hidey hole with my family. But I feel that God's given me an incredible opportunities, um, not only to share about him, but also to continue um, building relationships with other people and meeting other people and doing some amazing things that I never would have thought possible. And so I think I just have to keep trusting in him and being a Christian wherever he has me, whether it's with my family at home or whether it's, you know, in front of a TV camera. And that's the way I sort of rationalise it in my head. He will end it when he's ready to end it and he will keep it going. Sometimes I wish he wouldn't. <laughs> but no, look, I'm really grateful for all that he's done. That's and um, Yeah. Thank you.